Hey, greetings, friends, and welcome to, this would be week one, this would be lecture four. Okay, so we've defined our why. We've named our current reality. We've talked about the postures of the church and how those postures have been detrimental to the way in which the church is understood in these complex, chaotic, and what feels like crisis-driven times. We've also explored the opportunities and possibilities to think about in a movemental way. When the church is turned loose to embody in this world what I believe that Jesus was calling us to in that Acts mandate. But I want to talk a little bit about change because here's what I understand. To embrace crisis as an opportunity means we have to learn to embrace change. And let's face it, change is a challenge for many of us. I, I want to identify for us in this lecture just a few of the the barriers and obstructions to change and then I want to move us towards how do we how do we make a shift towards assessing our church's capacity to change and our willingness as a leader to change and the growth mindset that that's going to require the barriers are to change now I'm going to give you six I know this is an exhaustive list list and you are sharp you're smart and you're going to come up with ones that I haven't even thought of but a few barriers that I know to be true the first one is equilibrium we as humanity are prone to desire equilibrium. We want to settle in and settle down. But here's what I know about equilibrium. Equilibrium breeds comfort. Comfort gives birth to apathy. And apathy creates atrophy. Now think about this. When I get comfortable, I sit on my couch, I don't do anything, I'm not building my muscles. My muscles atrophy. The same thing is for the church. When we desire when we have this passion for equilibrium and stasis, for, for us to settle in and settle down, we become apathetic and our missional imagination atrophies. It's not that we can't, it's just that we have struggled to maintain the capacity to imagine a future that's different than the present that we're in. So equilibrium. The second one is our defaults. We have some deeply entrenched default mechanisms in our lives that keep people from gaining ground and keeping traction from going. Now, think about how that works in our lives. We might change for a little bit. Uh, let me give you an example. I might swear off ice cream for a moment, but ice cream is a comfort food. So when I'm doing well, when I'm feeling good, I don't eat any ice cream, but then stress hits. And my default mechanism that's rooted and wired in me through years of practice means that when stress hits, I am prone to seek out some ice cream. Got some snickerdoodle ice cream in the refrigerator right now. I'm just telling you, that's a default. We have organizational defaults in the church. Things that we've been prone to do, traditionally the way things have been done, even as leaders, we have defaults in the ways that we have handled situations. And we might change for a bit, but if you take your hands off the steering wheel and you don't push in press in towards change if you don't maintain that change we will go back to the default why is it that churches think about this a church will bring in a pastor they're running a hundred people that pastor makes significant changes is there for three or four years and then that pastor moves on and that church that had grown from 100 to 160 goes back to 100 maybe even 80 why because the change was never deeply embedded in the very culture of the church. And in fact, when that pastor who was the change agent left, there wasn't enough to maintain and they went back to the way things that they have done. Tribalism. Tribalism is another. People are drawn to camps. And when we identify certain groups by their tribes, we often limit our ability to walk across those boundaries to bring change. And so there's people, there's them and there's us. There's, and I see this happen in churches all the time. There, there are the traditionalists and the progressives. And we define, our, we define what we do by our preferences rather than a compelling vision for mission and the kingdom of God. And that's one of the challenges. In a Western model that says if you build it, it'll come, it creates consumerism. And consumerism drives this incapacity to change because really all it is is merely preference base and, and i want to say something here and this is sort of an aside i want to be clear with you about something that is so vital for you to hear when you move into a situ situation and you just begin to change things if that change is detached from an overarching bigger vision of what that change is for 
people will just simply see what you're doing is ad hoc changes and that drives people nuts every time you turn around something else is different no you have to root that sense of change in this bigger overarching picture of your why why are we doing what we are doing what is our clear sense of vision and mission i would also say one of the challenges for a change is we tend to we tend to uh, mix up technical and adaptive changes there are technical changes that we bring into our congregations. For instance, you might install a new database that helps you to manage information more efficiently. That's a technical change that you make. A technical change is a change you can make based upon the same set of mindset. And we've, we've, we've tried all sorts of technical changes in order for the church to, to embrace this moment of crisis as an opportunity. For instance, we, we, we turned church into a technical change. The, the, the church of hymns wasn't doing it so we 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 upped the ante on music the 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 person the the church that dressed nice wasn't doing it so we dressed out those are all technical changes but we can make all those changes without really changing our mindset of how we existed in the world but i want to say adaptive change requires a change of mindset and that's what we're going to be talking about we've got to embrace a new mindset about our posture our our very orientation in this world where we're not just simply a place that people come to, we are a people who are sent out into this world and to multiply the influence and the witness of Jesus everywhere we go. I think one of the one of the barriers to change is nostalgic pasts and uncertain fearful futures. People love to talk about the glory days and the good old days in which we could just get back to them. People say, I just want revival. And revival for them often means I just want to go back to what things have always been been and i want to say i don't want a revival i want the fresh wind of god's spirit to blow upon me so that i can lean forward into the newness that god has for me or the paralysis of analysis that would be my final barrier that i want to talk to you about the paralysis of analysis we get into these situations and as committees task forces boards we start to recognize the complexity of all those interwoven realities that we mentioned uh, two lectures ago and we begin to say what do we do and then we do nothing we don't start anywhere and one of the things i'm going to challenge you on one of the things that charlene lee is going to talk to you about in the disruption mindset is you got to start somewhere you got to do something you have to you have to lean forward at one point she's going to talk about burning the boat you got to go and not go backwards but those are the steps that we have to take now, I want you to move through, go down your, your PowerPoint here, where it says, resistance to change takes many forms. Think about this organizationally. In, in your organization, as you begin to seek to adapt the church to these complex times so that we can live movementally, you're going to have active resistors, people that are going to challenge you, people who like to send the, the letters on a Monday morning, people who will go to the board uh, for, the, for the base of their constituency to complain about you. Then there's going to be the passive resistance. These aren't people who are going to speak up. They're just not going to do anything to help you. Then there's going to be folks that are going to be compliant because they trust you and believe in you, but they're not going to be sold and bought in. But then there's going to be those who enthusiastically support. And one of the challenges we have to do is create and, and grow the critical mass of those who are enthusiastic. And I do believe, not in all cases, in all places, at all times, but I do believe that a compelling sense of vision and a compelling sense of mission and a clear why is, is huge in moving us forward. If it's just about growing my church, man, that's just not compelling enough for me to want to spend the kind of discomfort necessary uh, th to change. But if it's something bigger, if all of a sudden my life is caught up in this something bigger called the kingdom of God, then maybe that is inspiring enough to say, I'll give myself my preferences and my selfish ego to that. What I want you to do is I want you to look at your culture and your organization. And I want to plot. I want you to plot your place on this and you're going to do this in that that essay that's going to be do, done that's going to be due the end of the week once you've assessed your culture i also want you to assess yourself as a leader here's a here's a model many of you may see when we talk about change and innovation about 2.5 percent of the population are innovators 13.5 percent are early adopters the, the the majority of folks are are what we call early majority or late majority adopters and then we have uh uh, we have laggards, folks who change only because they have to. I want you to look at this. Innovators, they're the ones on the front end. They're on the, they're on the edge. They're the ones who are moving forward. They're taking ground. Uh, the early adopters are the ones that you're going to get critical mass to come along with you early. They believe in it. They get excited about it. The early majority, when they start to see some benefits of this, when they see, be able to see it moving forward, they're going to jump in and get involved. The late majority is when... when 
things have shifted and they know it's safe to come out of hiding, they start to jump in and laggards only change. Too often, we spend all of our time trying to change the laggers without realizing we have early adopters surrounding us all over the place. And if we can bring them on board and get them behind the movement of what God wants to do, God can do some incredible things. And I want you to, I want you to look at this and I want you to plot where you are in this. I want you to be honest, plot where you are, but then also plot where some of your team members are. And you can see that on the PowerPoint slide. I'm gonna pick this last piece up in one more short um, short lecture because I don't want this lecture to get too long. 